Well, it's great to be back with you again this morning. Uh, we so enjoyed being here with you last time, and we've been excited and looking forward to being back with you again uh, this Sunday as well. Good to finally meet uh, Brother Gene face to face. I've talked to him several times on the phone. It was, it was good to put a, a face with the name, so I enjoyed that. I enjoyed Sunday school this morning, and the, the singing this morning really blessed my heart. Something I like to do uh, upon occasion when I, I teach at some place once or twice, or I like to have a review. <coughs> a review, just nothing too difficult, but a little bit of a review. Uh, when I was here last time, I was able to introduce you to my brand new grandson. Uh, my daughter and my grandson came with us, and his name is Elijah. Does anybody remember what that means? Well, I had a lot of impact. <laughs> <laughs> Elijah means my God is Yah, or Yahweh. Uh, one of the songs spoke of the great I Am. Uh, when you see in the Bible the, the I Am in all capitals, or we saw it several times in Isaiah this morning, Lord in all capital letters. It's the name Yahweh. It's his personal name. No extra charge for that. That came right along with it. And then I gave you something else that's uh, equally as important to remember. It's the gospel. We spoke about that last time, about the gospel. And we looked at the biblical definition. Can anybody tell me what is the gospel? The good news. That's true. But there's a definition, a biblical definition that goes along. It's the power of God into salvation. It's the word of God. But there's a more specific uh, definition and understanding of what the gospel is. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. It's how the Messiah died for our sins, remember, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and rose again on the third day, according to to the scriptures. I could say, nurture charge. I'd just like to just see what kind of influence I'm having, and apparently not much. <laughs> but that's okay. We'll try again. Uh, open your Bibles this morning, if you will, to the biggest little book in the Bible, the book of Jude. We're going to start there this morning and go to a couple of other places, but that'll be our home base. The book of Jude, we're going to read verses 1 through 4. There's a lot of things in the book of Jude. It's not very many verses, 25 verses, very short, a couple of pages. Probably read it in 15, 20 minutes. But it's chock full of some great Bible truths. We don't have the time to do them all. We're going to focus on one thing in particular. Uh, but it is well worth your time to occasionally get into this book and read it and see what it has to say. All right, let's begin reading in verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called, mercy unto us, and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the, the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we just come before you with our Bibles open and our hearts open to receive an instruction from your word. We would pray for discernment, understanding, and, desire, and a desire in our hearts, burning to submit to your will, whatever it may be, that you would just speak to us this morning and whatever need that may be in our hearts and just lift us all up, Father. Guide us, teach us, fill us with your word and embolden our lives for your glory. We just ask these things in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. All right, let's get started. The book of Jude. Who's Jude? The brother of James. You got another brother? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus had brothers? 
Did y'all know that? How many knew that? Most of you. How many brothers did he have? Four. In Mark 6, in a place in Matthew as well, teaches there was four brothers. He names them. What about sisters? Did he have sisters? How many have? At least two. There in Mark, it says the brothers, names them, four of them, and the sisters. Plural. So at least two. So four brothers, two sisters, and this is one of them. And the other brother, James, became one of the big leaders of the church at Jerusalem. So it's Jude is speaking. To whom is he speaking? When you're trying to grasp and understand a passage of Scripture, you need to go and ask, his, who's speaking? Who's he speaking to? What's he speaking about? And what's that got to do with me? And there's some other things, but that's a good place to start. Who's speaking? James. And the Holy Spirit by inspiration. To whom is he speaking? You can speak, I like interactions. How do we know that? Says it right there. That's a good place to go. Sanctified, set apart, preserved in Christ Jesus. This is one of those, some of those things right here I was talking about. It's full of some great stuff. Sanctified by God, preserved in Christ Jesus, and called. Does that fit any of you out here this morning? Everyone? Praise God. Everyone? That'd be great. Tremendous. But that's Judas speaking by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. As it was said out, every believer. So in reality, what he's about to get into here is for you. Personally. Not like the old Baptist shovel. It's for the guy back there. It's not for me. Pass it on back to the other guy. It's not that. It's for you. Personally. Who's speaking, Jude? To who is he speaking? Believers. I like that preserved in Jesus. Look at verse four. You can, uh, 24. You can find a little bit more. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling even and to present you faultless before his presence, uh, the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So our security as a believer. Who does it rest in? Me? My performance? My capacity? My ability? It's his. His omnipotent power is in control of my preservation and call. That's another one. Uh, man, I wish we could spend some time on that. I'm, I'm prone to chase rabbits, but I'll, I'll fight the urge on this one. Uh, because that's a tremendous, tremendous uh, Bible truth there. He tells them in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation... It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. It's kind of interesting. He, he sat down with a pastoral love in his heart to share with other believers and talk about salvation. I like doing that. I don't like getting together and talking about salvation by grace. You're saved through faith and just all that uh, is involved in that. It's, I enjoy that. It's tremendous. And that was his original intent. But something moved within his spirit and changed his purpose in writing to these believers. Instead, he tells them, I was going to talk to you about our common salvation, but instead I'm writing to you to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. He goes on to explain in the remainder of the chapter exactly what that was. There was false teachers. Now in Jerusalem, at this time, they didn't have a building like we have here. They would meet in the temple or around the temple. And you can study from Acts and other places that they met house to house. There were just literally thousands of people joining themselves to them. So it was quite difficult uh, to get them all in one place. And so I don't know if what he's writing here is something he personally personally experienced he saw this happening or if he heard it uh, through the gospel grapevine or what's going on but nonetheless it was taking place these false teachers were creeping in and that alarmed him alerted him to the necessity of compelling all believers each and every one of us here this morning to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints that has been the history of of believers throughout. 
as you study all through what we call the New Testament, you'll find warning after warning after warning about false teachers, false prophets, false messiahs that they're going to come. They were coming then, <laughs> and they hadn't stopped. They're coming more and more and more. And in his exhortation to contend for the faith, I believe, as he was moved by this information that he had, however he got it, that these false teachers were coming in and there was a threat to the body of believers. He was sounding out an alarm. Wake up. There's a problem on hand. We all need to take part in responding to this situation. It was true then and it's true now. As he spoke here, he started to do this, but he felt this calling to speak about this, this threat. As was said here, we're all believers here. I pray that's true. Have you recently sensed anything like that in your heart? Do you sense anything like that happening in the world? An increasing, growing darkness and threat on the body of believers? I do. I have an advantage on some and not so much on others. I'm getting old. <laughs> so I have something to compare it to. I can look back. I'm 59, I think. My wife can correct me. I think I'm 59. I can look back when I was a kid. And things, there was sin there and there was bad stuff. And, and surely false teachers. But over these past so many years, I've been saved now about 30 some odd years. And, and as I survey what's happening in the world, to me it's getting dark. Uh, I mean, uh, in this nation, supposed uh, Christian nation, the thing that's happening in, uh, in this world, and what, how, it seems to just be getting worse every day. Uh, Testing a little bit in Sunday school this morning about when things began to turn in this nation. Uh, I don't know, I can't really put my finger on here, uh, but I know that in my life, I've seen it get worse and worse and worse, and I, and I feel it. And I make it a point to, to study a lot of different uh, teachers, and I'm observant of what I see on television and around the world, and uh, I see, uh, maybe it's just in my small little world, and homogenization, I think that's a word, <laughs> a homo homogenization where you can't really tell you got this uh, group of believers over here and you got this group of believers over here. But if you get in there and, and say, you know, oh, exactly what is it that you believe, what do you stand for? It's kind of vague. It's kind of squishy. <laughs> it's, oh, we believe in the love of God and this, you know, the blessings. And, but you try to nail them down on doctrine, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, they fear that that term doctrine well here in Jude 3 that, uh, that's what we're finding out is being spoken of here when he talks about the faith how would you define that earnestly contend for we're supposed to be fighting or contending for it how would you define the faith once delivered unto the saints I've got a technical I guess definition of it it's the system of doctrines and practice wants to live into the saints. Does that make sense to you? Does that sound about what, in, in a ballpark of what you would call it? The system of doctrines and practice. But it goes on to say, once delivered. What does that teach us? Once delivered. At this time, very early on in the history, that system of doctrine and practice was already complete and delivered. Not delivered one time, but delivered once and for all. It does not continue to evolve. There's not a need for new revelation. That revelation is complete right here. It's not everything that God knows, but it's everything that God wants us to know at this time, according to his will. This teaches us the entirety 
of what the faith is. And it involves that term doctrine. Uh, you study in Acts chapter 2, it talks about they continued steadfastly every day in the apostles' doctrine. Fellowship, prayer, and breaking of bread. That was the centrality of the ministry, was the teaching and preaching of that word. Uh, it's kind of hard for us to fathom right now, but back then, they did it for hours. <laughs> hours. I'm watching my clock up here. I, know, <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't have that much time today. Or, I can stay, but I'd probably leave. But, uh, that's, uh, I, I know Paul in particular, he started in the afternoon, preached through the night. Somebody fell out of the window. They went down and revived him. They got back up, and they went again into the following morning. Teaching, 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 teaching. It's been a kind of interest in my life since early on. I was raised to Church of Christ, but I was a lost. I was a pagan, but I, was, I knew all the Bible stories and everything until I was uh, 27 years old. And I was saved under the, the preaching of an old gnarly-fingered East Texas brat. This preacher that would stick his finger in my face every week. He didn't know who I was. I didn't know who he was, but he just ripped my guts out every week with that finger in my face. <clears throat> and I didn't know nothing from nothing but once I uh, made my profession and got baptized it wasn't but a week or two later they stuck a book in my hand and said teach the teenagers <laughs> Boy, okay that began my study and I found out that there was Baptist and then there was Southern Baptist and then there was uh, Primitive Baptist and there's and just kind of confused me that so many different things and so many different beliefs and so many which one's right which one's right and so that's been a pursuit for now 20, 30 some odd years that I've, that's been an interest of mine. And I've always asked people, why are you? Why are you a Baptist? Uh, I worked in a little print shop when I was going to school and people would come through and I'd get to know them and talk to them. And, uh, and I know that they're a member of the Presbyterian or a member of the Baptist or a member of this. And, and why are you a Baptist? Why are you this or that? And some of the answers that I would get, they're just kind of interesting. Uh, probably the best one I've ever heard was, uh, I married into it. I was a Presbyterian, but my wife was a Baptist, and once we got married, I'm a Baptist. It's kind of different. And this one kind of tickled me. It's kind of, and there's a church that sponsored the school there in town in, in uh, Henderson, Texas. It kind of got bigger, and a Presbyterian church had moved out of their building to a bigger building, so the Baptists moved in. And, they were going there for a while and things were starting to get together and they noticed a gentleman every week was sitting over there and nobody, who's, I don't know who he is. They finally walked over to him, you know, introduced herself, tried to get to know the guy. And long story short, he had been a member of that Presbyterian church. And he said, they left me. I didn't leave then. <laughs> He'd been there since a child, grew up in that building or whatever. But that's, it's different. But, He's telling us here something that we're to be contend for. The word there comes from the word that we get agony from. It's used in reference to how athletes train and conduct themselves uh, like a fighter or, or whatever. That's the word that's being used here. Something very strenuous and physically involved in that with all their might to perform this duty. And that's what he's calling upon us to do. If you know anything about your Baptist history, you'll know that it's not just contending for it, it's dying for it. It's dying for it. It's, well, that's back in the old times. No, there's people dying for it right now. Uh, being beheaded and all kinds of other terrible uh, deaths that you can imagine. Children, adults, everybody that are dying. But I notice here, He's calling upon us to contend for this faith. The faith, system, doctrines, a system of doctrines and practice, once delivered into the saints. Complete, it's there, delivered once and for all. But I notice that it says, the faith, not faith. It doesn't say, earnestly contend for the denomination. It says, for the faith, once delivered unto the saints. That system of doctrines and practice. Now, where do we understand and get what he's talking about here? As I told you last time I was here, it's this book. 
Uh, it's called Old Testament and New Testament. I don't like that. And 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15, 16, and 17. He's talking to Timothy again. He says that from a small child, you studied the holy scriptures that were able to make you wise unto salvation. And in it also, this is paraphrase from uh, Frank's translation, anything that you need to know about serving God, about pleasing God, is in the Holy Scriptures. Not the Old Testament, the New The Holy Scriptures. This is one book, not two. And it's able to make us, to help us to understand exactly what it is that God wants us to do and how to please Him in our lives. What His purpose and His will for us is in this book. Now, Jude spoke about contending for this, which requires you personally. I could stand up here and just take off in left field, and there's a lot of places I've been would never know the difference. Okay. Amen. I was a member of a church one time that uh, I really loved the pastor. He was a good old boy. And just He could really lay it down, and I remember right toward the end of his ministry there, he, he preached on some different things, and I remember all the way through it, the, the congregation, amen, preacher, amen, that, that, that's right, preacher, that's good stuff every week. Well, then after he left and the new preacher came in, it wasn't just a short, short while later that that preacher started teaching along that same lines, but <laughs> the direct opposite of what the previous pastor had been teaching about. And how did they respond? Amen, that's, oh yeah, that's good stuff. So a, a lot of folks, when pressed on what they believe and why they believe, are left a little vague. They don't really have that much confidence in what they're believing. And that's going to cause a problem and has caused a problem. In this country in particular, uh, we talk a whole lot about our Constitution and all these different things. What is the basis and premises for our Constitution? Well, that's true. But it's a Declaration of Independence. How does that go? We'll just get down to the meat of it. Are endowed... Where'd we get them? By the Creator. And Dad was certain inalienable rights from our Creator. Our rights, whatever they may be, come from Him. And the premise of moving into our Constitution is based on that. You take that away, that's the foundation. What do you got left? A piece of paper sitting up there getting dust on it. That's what's happened in our country. They've taken that concept of the Creator out. And they're peppering it in with, well, we all worship the same God. Okay? <laughs> not really. And that's why I say there's, there's one faith. Like I said, not one denomination, one faith, one system of doctrines and practice. And we don't have time here to, to get all elaborate about it and, and, and uh, discuss all the many aspects of that. I challenge you to determine that for yourself. But I want you to read something else with me. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So here, Paul gives a, another warning along the same line that Jude gave. They might have known each other. Who knows? But they're preaching from the same book. Contend for the faith because in the latter times, many are going to depart from the faith. How are you going to know? How are you going to know if they depart from the faith? What's the standard that you can say, well, they've left the faith. They've departed the faith. Now, it's easy 
If, if they leave this church and join that church, oh, they departed from the faith. <laughs> Not necessarily. They departed from the teachings of this book right here. Or whatever it may be, the inerrancy, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, on whatever it may be. The necessity of preaching repentance and faith and the Lord Jesus Christ, plus nothing, minus nothing. All these different things. Uh, one of the, uh, I'll try not to get carried off of my hobby horse here, but the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel is so contrary to the teaching and uh, preaching of this word. Just read 1 Timothy chapter 6 in your own time. Just read 1 Timothy chapter 6. And you'll see, but that's, how do I know? How do I know? That's this book. When that preacher I talked to you about started teaching and preaching those things, I mentioned it to a friend of mine. I said, this guy, he looked good. He, his, he had a King James Bible, about three times as big as mine. One of them great big things. And, and so he looked good. And when he first started peppering those Things. He didn't come out right out of the box and say, I'm going to take y'all down the road. Little. This much truth, this much false. I punched him. Something, something ain't sounding right about this guy. I, I don't know what's happening, but he's going to take us someplace where we don't want to go. And he said, you're, you're crazy. You're an idiot. Hey, this serious. That's how he responded to him. Over time, I, he and the pastor and I would have several talks about this stuff, and I would confront him about it. I'd write something up, and I'd give it to him. Anyway, long story short, down the road. It was all said and done. There was a big blow-up. A lot of pain, a lot of sorrow, a lot of suffering, a lot of people calling me a lot of dirty names and things like that. <clears throat> the brother came to me, the one that called me an idiot, and I'm sorry. Now, I, I'm not Superman. I don't know a lot of stuff, but I know what this book says. I know what this book says. Do you? Because the command to contend for this faith is up to you. The warning that many are going to depart from the faith is to you. If you're not grounded in this, even if you are, you're vulnerable. Because look at what Paul says here. It's not just a physical thing, uh, personalities and things like that. It's, it's deeper than that. That in latter times they shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And not just a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. Behind each and every false doctrine, every lie, which is a false doctrine, is the father of lies. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20, it says... They don't realize it, but when they sacrifice to these idols, they're sacrificing to demons. So it's not just a physical thing. I like this preacher better than that. I like that singing better than this. It's a, it's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual concern. That if you don't have this word to base your faith in, you're very vulnerable. The only way you're going to know is if you have this word in you. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved. A workman unto God that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. We mentioned 2 Timothy 3.15, 16, 17. It is everything I need to know. I don't need a new revelation. Right here in this book tells me everything that I need to know. Now it's contend for the faith. Not be contentious for the faith. Contend, there's a, there's a purpose in it. And here in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. We're back up to 24 as well. This is, I started to say, a problem I used to have, but it's a problem I still have. Because <laughs> a lot of times, I, I, I know I'm right. <laughs> it may take you a while to figure it out, but I know I'm right. And so, I'm being a little bit facetious there. 
But that's, I have been that way in the past. Where I get myself into a situation where that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to convince you that you're wrong and I'm right. That's being contentious. That's not what contending for the faith is. Look here in 2 Timothy, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. That's the goal. That's the purpose. It's not just to prove them wrong and you right. It has a purpose to win that brother or sister back into the faith. Or maybe into the faith for the very first time. That's the goal. That's the object. And once again, the only way that you can do that, we talked about it at the beginning of the service. If that person is lost, debating and discussing a doctrinal uh, disagreement is a waste of time. They are dead in their trespasses and sin. They need to be born again. And as we said at the beginning of the service, and we spoke about the last time I was here, it's the gospel that is the power of God into salvation. How the Messiah died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That person's only hope I can convince them about baptism. I can convince them about whatever there may be in some type of a, a doctrinal discussion. But if the person is dead in their sins and we separate our past, he's going off to hell. Unless the gospel. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. That's the person's only hope. That's the person's only hope is to have that word. God chose that that is the, uh, his capacity to bring that person to salvation. The spoken word. He chose the foolishness of preaching <laughs> that some might be saved. By speaking his word, born again by the word of God. That is the power for salvation. That is the power of understanding and uh, getting your roots, uh, roots deep down into the faith once delivered unto the saints. One other place I'd like to go to quickly before we close. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul speaking again. So now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he is God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God there has been an ever present threat throughout the existence of scripture before Christ after Christ there has always been apostates, false teachers. But as we approach the second coming in these latter days, they're going to be more evident, more prominent, more threatening to the people of God. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. The signs or the birth pains of his coming, which a birth pain, a contraction of a woman, uh, fiction to have a baby, a woman can fill us in on that, they start moderate, then they get more intense, and then they get closer together, and then the baby's delivered. That's the same thing. These are the birth pangs of his second coming. They're going to be more frequent and more intense. All those wars, rumors of wars, uh, pestilence, all those different things. But 
False messiahs, false teachers are in that group as well. They're going to be more evident, more prominent, more threatening to the body. And it's going to cause more damage because it says many will depart from the faith. Again in Timothy, Paul warned Timothy, says there's going to come a time that they're not going to want to hear doctrine, <laughs> but instead will turn themselves away to fables and foolish tales. And I know today there are many church growth techniques, and I've seen a bunch <laughs> in my life. Even to the, one of the most popular ones today is you go into this neighborhood and survey what kind of church would you like to have? Well, we'd like this, see, and we'd like that. Okay, <laughs> we'll make it that way. But that's, the, the threat here is more intense than we can possibly imagine. And the remedy by inspiration through Paul, uh, through Paul to Timothy was when they don't want to hear doctrine, accommodate the times and moderate your message. And make yourself more appealing. Is that what he said? That's, that's the, in a short bit, that's the, one of the more popular theories of church growth today. Let the lost person dead in his sin be more comfortable in your congregation. That's not Paul to Timothy. When you're in that congregation, the people that don't want to hear doctrine, what do you do, Timothy? Preach doctrine. <laughs> Don't change your message. Don't moderate your presentation. You preach the word. It's the word that will change eternal destinies. It's the word that will change our lives. It's the word that leads us in the path that are pleasing to him. That will affect the world. That will be the light unto the world in times of deepest darkness. I see a, an intensifying of darkness that I haven't seen as my 59 years. It's getting worse. I don't want to get political. And I'm not trying to take sides, but I've heard a lot of Christians talk about this upcoming election. I just say, looking at our candidates, okay? To me, that president is like a thermometer of a nation. That leader of that, whatever nation is, it's a thermometer of the condition and moral character of the nation. And as I look at these two candidates, we got a sick country. It's got a high fever, whichever way you think you should go. Whichever way you think you should go. Uh, both profess Christianity. But when I put it to the test, I uh, put this up there and get my square and plumb out there, uh, what they say don't fit. What they say they don't fit. So to me, that's, a, that's an indication of where our country is, how far we have drifted away from those solid moorings that, that anchor of truth, the Word of God. That I can see, I don't know when it's, I, I don't know when the end of the world is his and all these different things, but I know what this book says. There was an appeal back then, almost 2,000 years ago, to contend for the faith. Why? Because many are going to fall away. It's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And just before he comes, there's going to be something that's going to be marked that can be identifiable. He says, and until the falling away comes and the man of sin be revealed. So I can see through this book there's something. They've always been drifting away. They've always been apostates. There's always been people uh, falling prey to false teachings. Now, I've met several people that are now Jehovah's Witnesses that used to be Baptists. <laughs> uh, it's full of used to be something or others. Because that's, that's where the, the cults feed is those babes or borderlines uh, in the faith. So I see something coming. I sense Something coming. I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I can just sense something's fixing to happen. I don't know what it is, when it is. Like I say, I'm not a prophet. 
But according to this word right here, something's coming. The appeal to you personally. You personally. Because you will one day give an account. Before the master. You'll give an account. Earnestly contend for the faith. Jude finishes up this appeal with just a few words of exhortation as to how we can accomplish that. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. On some have compassion, making a difference. And others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even that the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep us, keep you from falling into the, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God and our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Father, we just come before you. As we close, and I've rattled on here probably too long. But as I study your word, I sense this darkening in our country and around the world. I sense an increasing threat. And these words of your apostles, your messengers, of the need to contend for the faith. To not be shocked or overcome at the realization of some departing. But it's a call by your spirit for us to deepen our trust, to deepen our walk, to deepen our understanding and to be ever present in pursuing your word. Help us, Father. Give us strength. Give us patience. Give us understanding. Give us all the things necessary to confront these days ahead of us. And may we live for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.